Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, and Marie, I'm not quite sure that I'm going to be covering what, what you wanted me to. What I'm really going to be talking about is how I understand the social determinants of mental health. Um, and so um, that, that's what I'm going to be talking about. So if you're a mom with two kids, a single mom with two kids, it's Tuesday night, you don't get paid until Friday, you open the fridge, you know you need to make dinner, and this is what you see, how are you going to feel? Lousy. Lousy? Desperate. 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 Depressed. So I'm going to be talking about food insecurity a little bit later on, but it's sort of obvious that food insecurity sets the stage for poor mental health. And I'm going to argue that it also increases risk for mental illnesses um, and, and behavioral disorders. So this is my sort of dis disclosure slide. Um, I don't have any affiliations with industry. I do have quite a few research grants. My research is on um, the interface between the criminal justice system and, and people living with serious mental illnesses. Um, so invite me back in a couple of years and I'll tell you all about um, that interface and how we can try to help our patients stay out of jail um, and reduce arrests and stay out of prison, etc. I also do some research on first episode psychosis. Um, and I do receive some royalties for this book that I'm going to be mentioning. The royalties are small. If, if you've ever published an academic book, the royalties are small. So if, if some of you go out and buy this book that I'm going to be talking about, I'll probably get about a quarter or maybe 50 cents, enough to buy myself a Diet Mountain Dew. Um, and I drink a lot of Diet Mountain Dew and I want you to buy the book because I'm working on an, another book right now that I'm going to be telling you about toward the very end. And so I need a lot of caffeine in order to <laughs> produce this next book. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. What are the social determinants of mental health? I'm going to give you some examples of them and how they work. Um, and finally, what we can do. What we as physicians and health providers can do and what we as society can do. And then you'll need to think about what you as, as a Medicaid authority can do because I'm not an, a, an expert on that per se. So what are the social determinants of health? These are the societal, environmental, economic conditions that impact and affect mental health across populations. These conditions are shaped by the distribution of money, power, resources at the global, national, local levels, which are themselves influenced by policy. Policy. The social determinants of health are largely responsible for health inequities. So what are health inequities? I know that you all know this. I just want to cover the difference between health disparities and health inequities very briefly. A health disparity is a difference in health outcomes or prevalence or incidence based on some innate characteristic like race, for example, or gender, or ethnicity, or some um, condition like disability, or by where you live. It's a difference in health outcomes. That's a health disparity. A health inequity is a health disparity that is the result of systemic avoidable and unjust social and economic policies and practices. So a health inequity is an unjust, unfair, avoidable health disparity that really are grounded in policies. They're there because of policies. So the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has done some research to try to figure out how we can all talk about the social determinants of health regardless of political persuasion. Um, and this, these are some of the taglines that came out of their research. This is what the social determinants of health really is. Health begins where we live, learn, work, and play. That's something we can all get around and agree um, without having to use the word social. Um, and your zip code may be more important to your overall health than your genetic code. And we've heard that over and over, and we know that to be true. Um, even the furthest of health outcomes like longevity, lifespan, is very much driven by your zip code. There are prominent disparities, um, inequities in lifespan by 
zip code, by census tract, by state, etc. So that tells you that lifespan is to some large extent driven by things other than genetics and other than the healthcare system per se. Per se. So um, this, is, uh, this topic is also about social justice, and so I just wanted to give you one quick definition of social justice. It's assuring the protection of equal access, equal access to liberties, rights, and opportunities, and it's also about taking care of the least advantaged members of society. So it's sort of twofold, social justice. And social justice is really the moral foundation of the field of public health. And what I'm talking about is really the social determinants is a public health issue and so I wanted to just point out that the moral foundation of the field of public health is social justice and it really again ensures that individuals in society have equal opportunities to lead healthy, meaningful and productive lives. So this is social determinants of health is about social justice. So what are the social determinants of mental health? This is another my own definition. These are social, uh, the social determinants are societal problems, societal problems affecting communities, families, and individuals that interfere with achieving optimal mental health and that also increase risk for mental illnesses and substance use disorders. That's what the social determinants of mental health is. And I'm calling out the distinction of the social determinants of mental health as opposed to just the social determinants of health because as we all know mental illnesses and substance use disorders are highly prevalent, highly disabling, they're high cost. Um, the, the social determinants of health are the same actually as the social determinants of mental health but one interesting difference is that I think that the social determinants actually have more potent effects on mental health outcomes and mental illnesses than they do on physical health outcomes and physical illnesses. And I'm going to tell you my theory about how that works um, toward the end, but a little heads up on my theory. Unlike most physical health conditions like hypertension, for example, as we all know, mental illnesses are not only crea created in part by the social determinants, but they also lead to social outcomes that are the exact same things as the social determinants. And so I'll walk through this again toward the end because I think it's really, really important for our field. So this is, this is my diagram about how the social determinants sort of work and I'm going to walk you through this. In these, these boxes with the dotted lines, those are some of the social determinants and I'm going to walk through a list in just a minute. These are some of the social determinants. Um, things like food insecurity, as was mentioned, discrimination, adverse early life experiences, things related to employment, to housing, etc. I'll walk through a whole list of these shortly. The way that these work, though, is in several ways. One is that they cause psychological stress. That first slide that I had up with the, the empty fridge, that causes mom to have psychological stress. As we all know, psychological stress leads to physiologic stress responses that are associated with increased risk for physical illnesses and mental illnesses. So that's one pathway. They also lead to what appear to be poor choices. You know, we've heard that our patients make poor choices, right? Well, the, the choices that we make are bound by the choices that we have, and so they, all of these social determinants can lead to reduced options, reduced options. That looks like poor choices and it's really behavioral risk factors. So these are the, the sort of the, this is the risk factor level, up here are the adverse health outcomes. So the social determinants are the causes of the causes. They underpin risk factors that we observe clinically in our patients at the societal level. These are functioning at the societal level. It, as it happens, families are also impacted and individuals are also impacted, but these are really societal problems. So my, um, my co-editor of, of the book is Ruth Shim. She's now in Sacramento. She and I did a lot of thinking about the fact that these are highly, highly comorbid. If you have housing instability, it's not uncommon that you also have job insecurity or even unemployment. You might also have food insecurity. You might also have poor access to health care, etc. 
so we were wondering, well, what's underpinning those social determinants? If they're so comorbid, there must be something underneath them that's driving them. We sort of decided that it's an unfair and unjust distribution of opportunity. What do I mean by the word opportunity? It's really about power, empowerment, voice, access to resources. That's what opportunity is. So then we kind of scratched our heads and said, well, what's underpinning that? Why do we have unfair and unjust distribution of opportunity? And we decided that it's two things. One is public policies and the other is social norms. Public policies are things that are codified. They're written somewhere. It's almost like they're written in stone, really. They're laws, ordinances, rules, regulation, legislation, court decisions. That's public policy. And it underpins all of the social determinants. It underpins how we divvy up opportunity. The other, though, is social norms. These are the things that are not written anywhere. It's how groups think about other groups. The opinions that we have, the biases that we have, the stigmas that we hold toward one another, etc. Those are the social norms. By the way, social norms obviously push public policies. Public policies also push social norms. So these two things are interacting. But at the bottom of, of any social determinant and therefore at the bottom of any illness, is public policies and social norms that it, that's really driving it. That's how I understand the social determinants. So here's sort of a list of some social determinants. Discrimination and social exclusion is a very important set of social determinants. Nelson Mandela said, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate and if they can learn to hate they can be taught to love for love it comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite, discrimination. I'm going to come back to this one shortly. Adverse early life experiences. This is one that we're most familiar with probably as mental health professionals. Um, there's a whole set of social determinants related to education. Low educational attainment is the one that we think of most often, but also it's about the quality of education and it's about educational <coughs> equality or inequality an important social determinant. FDR said that the school is the last expenditure upon which America should be willing to economize. A whole set of social determinants related to employment. We all know that unemployment is a social determinant, but so is underemployment, which means that you're not employed up to your full potential. That's kind of stressful if you, if you know that that's that's happening. And also job insecurity, which means not being sure that you're going to have your job at the end of the month or the end of the year. That's very stressful, job insecurity. So it's an important social determinant. And I, I can tell you that although we as mental health professionals do a pretty good job at screening for unemployment, we know if our patients are unemployed, I bet you we're not screening for job insecurity. So it's an important social determinant. Another set of social determinants relates to income, poverty, which is sort of an absolute metric, but also relative poverty, which we call income inequality or wealth inequality. This is an important set of social determinants. There's a book called The Spirit Level that shows over and over and over for every health outcome that you can imagine that income inequality in a society, whether it's, one of, whether it's the 50 U.S. states or a whole host of um, uh, westernized uh, uh, high-income countries, the higher the level of income inequality in society, the higher the, lev the prevalence of illness, including major depression, for example. And then other things related to wealth and income, like concentrated neighborhood poverty, is another important social determinant of, of health. Food insecurity, as I mentioned, and I'm going to come back to this one. Um, social determinants related to housing, and it's not just homelessness. It's also about the quality of housing, and it's about housing instability, which again means having to move around a lot. We know that our patients with serious mental illnesses move around a lot uh, but for, for all sorts of reasons. That's a social determinant of health, housing instability. Adverse features of the built environment, this is talked about a lot. In the field of public health, we don't talk about it nearly as much in mental health, but this, the, the, the built environment means everything that we've built, 
the energy infrastructure, the transportation in infrastructure, parks, re re recreation, green space, everything that we've built. There are good things built into that and not so good things built into that. And those adverse features of the built environment are actually drivers of health outcomes. Whether it's the walkability of a neighborhood is related to overweight and obesity, um, or it, your access to green space, etc. Very little research with regard to mental health in the, um, this area. But I suspect that it's also a social determinant of mental health. Obviously, poor access to health care is an important social determinant of mental health. Poor or unequal access to transportation, exposure to conflict, violence, war, forced immigration, etc. Our practices on the border. Um, exposure to pollution. And our colleague um, Dave Pollack in, in Oregon says that the ultimate social determinant is actually related to global climate change. And it is a social determinant of health. And it's, it affects people differentially. It's not divvied up equally in society. Criminal justice involvement is a social determinant of health. Um, and again, this is one that I'm particularly interested in, especially for our patients with serious mental illnesses. So the, these, these social determinants are really, again, the causes of the causes. They're the fundamental causes of disease. If risk factors are the precursors, then these environmental and contextual factors drive and shape the risk factors. So a few examples of how these work. Um, I don't have kids, but I'm told that four-year-olds, I think it's four-year-olds, ask a, a question over and over and over. And to really understand the social determinants, all you have to do is ask this question over and over and over. What do four-year-olds year ask? Why? 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 So that's what you need to do if you're thinking about the social determinants. Here's an example. Why is Jason in the hospital? Because he has a bad infection in his leg. So we're all, as physicians, we're already thinking what type of disease is this? Is it a communicable disease, an infectious disease? Is it a behavioral disorder? Is it a chronic non-communicable disease? It's an infectious disease, right? We're talking about a disease that's caused by a pathogen, a bacteria, right? But why does he have an infection? He has a cut on his leg and it got infected. But why does he have a cut on his leg? He was playing in a junkyard next to his apartment building and he fell on some sharp, jagged steel there. But why was he playing in that junkyard? His neighborhood is run down, kids play there and there's no one to supervise them. But why does he live there in that neighborhood? His parents can't afford a nicer place to live. But why can't his parents afford a nicer place to live? His dad is unemployed and his mom is sick. But why is his dad unemployed? Because he doesn't have much education and he can't find a job. But why? We could keep going and going and going and we would find ourselves at public policies and social norms. In this case, we, we only got down so far as that dad is unemployed because he has low education, probably related to educational inequalities, right? Um, but at the bottom of this, deeper and deeper, public policies and social norms. That's why dad has low education and is unemployed. And this is, this is a biological disease. It's caused by a bacteria, but I'm suggesting that somehow underpinning that causation, underpinning the risk factors are causes of causes, social determinants, many of them that are, are commingled and, and comorbid. So I've listed probably 20 different social determinants. I'm going to very briefly just walk through three and how I understand these and how I think they work. Um, one is, I'm not going to talk much about this, adverse childhood experiences. We all know about this. Here's a definition of ACEs. I'm sure that you've all heard of the ACE study from Kaiser Permanente. Since then, dozens and dozens of publications have come out that show that adverse childhood experiences, which are common in the population, underpin or are, rela are associated with multiple, multiple physical health and mental health outcomes. Almost any social or health outcome that you can think of, if it's been studied in relation to ACEs, there's an association. 
right now some of my research secondary analyses of data sets that I have we're looking at ACEs among people with serious mental illnesses and their arrest record in adulthood and there's an association even when we control for stuff um, so ACEs you know clearly I think our field really understands this topic pretty well um, going all the way back to you know Freud um, and so I think we all understand that we have to talk to our patients about this we have to do it in a, a trauma-informed um, way etc some of these associations are not just sort of linear but they're almost exponential this is an example of ACEs in, in childhood and um, attempted suicide in adulthood and you can see that once you get up to five or more ACEs it really just exponentially increases your risk of suicide attempt as an adult the second example that I'm going to talk about is gender discrimination or sexism. You know, uh, the first social determinant that I mentioned was discrimination. Usually I talk about racism, but I wanted to challenge myself a little bit this time around. And I decided, let me talk about gender discrimination or sexism. And I'm not an expert on this, but I'm, this is just simply how I think about sexism and how it works. I think that it's a pervasive, highly detrimental U.S. societal problem that should be a top priority from a health perspective of policy making and policy change. We should be making policy in this area to improve health. To improve health. We know that there are relatively sharp differences in opportunities for men and women. Um, for example, women across all major professions earn less for the same work than men. We know that single women accumulate less wealth than single men. And perhaps most glaringly, we all know that among our 45 highest American leaders since the founding of our country, none of them have been women. So that tells you right there that we're on to not a genetic issue. This is not related to X chromosomes and Y chromosomes, but a societal problem, right? Sexism as a societal problem. It's a social determinant of health and it's underpinned like the other social determinants by an unfair and unjust distribution of opportunity. We've divided opportunity differently between men and women, right? Unfair and unjust. Um, and th that is undoubtedly built upon by both public policies and social norms. So this is sort of how I think about gender discrimination sort of getting under under your skin and into your body and into your mind and increasing uh, poor mental health outcomes. First, and um, uh, perhaps most benign of the three ways that I'm going to mention, is that it leads to, I think, I'm not an expert in this area, a chronic sense of disempowerment. It might be subtle, but there's a chronic sense of disempowerment. If that's the case, we all know that feeling empowered is good for your health and feeling disempowered is bad for your health. We know that there's a lot of research on empowerment and health outcomes. So that, that could be one way that gender discrimination works. And the same is true for race-based discrimination, right? Or any other form of discrimination. This chronic sense of disempowerment. Compared to boys, who when they're growing up they hear you can be anything you want to be. Girls might hear that but they know that to some extent that's not true. All you have to do again is look at our list of presidents for example. A second way that sexism gets under the skin and into the body and mind is through chronic stress. Feeling disempowered, not being able to achieve the income that one needs to support a family or bumping up against glass ceilings causes some level of chronic or even acute psychological distress. And as I pointed out earlier, psychological distress causes a physiologic stress response and we know that that ramped up sec uh, stress response is not good for health outcomes. This form of oppression, by the way, has been termed structural violence when talking about racism. Structural violence when talking about racism. That means that it's not overt violence, it's not um, perhaps killing, although we have a history of that with regard to racism. It's built into the structure of society. That's why it's called structural violence. A third way that gender discrimination um, uh, sort of uh, is a social determinant 
is um, that it's associated with interpersonal violence, not just structural violence, but actual violence, right? And this is back to the ACEs story, and we know that women who have experienced traumatic events have uh, poorer health outcomes. So this is sort of how I, and I'm not an expert in gender discrimination at all, but this is how I sort of understand it as a social determinant of health. The third example that I'm going to walk through briefly is food insecurity. This is one that I'm particularly interested in, partly because I love food and I'm very interested in all things food and food policy and food chains, etc. Um, this is a, a drawing of food policy. The artist Candy Chang drew this. It's meant to show what food insecurity is. It, food insecurity means you're not sure that you're going to have enough food to last to the end of the week or to last to the end of the month, basically. That's what food insecurity is. And I'm, I'm focusing on this one right now because I think we have a long way to go in mental health in terms of addressing food insecurity. We don't even really screen for it. Um, whereas in primary care, it's, it's clear that this, it's becoming clearer that this is something that's really important and we need to be thinking about. So this is a definition of food insecurity. It means that you're not, uh, basically, you're not sure that you're going to be able to get access to nutritious food. Um, the USDA in D.C., every year they do a big, huge, nationally representative survey to measure food insecurity in households across the country. And it always, year after year after year, comes back right around in the 12, 13, 14 percent range, depending on how the economy is doing. In 2017, it was about 12% of all U.S. households. Uh, by the way, there's quite a bit of variability in that percentage by the state that you live in. So I grew up in Virginia. Um, you might tell from my accent that I'm not a New Yorker um, by birth or upbringing. I grew up in Virginia, and the state just south of us is North Carolina. The two states are very, very, very similar. Same demography, same geography, same like industries and farming, etc. You wouldn't be, if, if you were plopped down in one of those two states, you wouldn't know which one you're in. They're very similar. The prevalence of food insecurity, though, in Virginia is relatively low, something around 9%. In North Carolina, around 16, 17%. That tells you that this is not related to the demographics or the geography or the farming that's going on, et cetera. It tells you that it's something about policy, the way the state is administering policy or, or creating policy. Maybe how they administer their Medicaid program, I don't know. Maybe how they administer their SNAP program, something about policy because it's not uh, uh, clearly just related to the state. The WHO says that food security is built on these three pillars. One is food availability. You have to have sufficient quantities of food um, available on a, cons a consistent basis. Another is food access, which is sufficient resources to obtain the food. Um, and then finally, food use, which is appropriate use based on knowledge of basic nutrition and how to, how to cook and pre prepare food, etc. I would suggest that our prevalence of about 12, 13, 14 percent of food insecurity by household in the U.S. is not related to food availability. Um, we have more than enough food to go around in this country. In fact, we waste tons and tons and tons of food. There's plenty of food to go around, plenty of food to go around. So why are 12 percent of our households hungry? I would also argue that it's, it's probably not about food use. Maybe in some low-income countries, there's an element of food use as, a, as one of the issues. Definitely in low-income countries like sub-Saharan African countries, it's mainly about food availability. There's just not enough food. Um, and of course, the prevalence of food insecurity in a low-income country is much higher than it is in the U.S. But I would say that it's probably not about food use. I mean, we typically, if you can get food, you're able to take in the food in a safe way that's not going to make you sick, typically. Rather, in the U.S., it's really about food access. Some people just don't have access to the food that's out there and available. That's, that's the cause of food insecurity in the U.S. Food insecurity is important for us to be thinking about. There are clear linkages to depression, some research on anxiety disorders, and kids, we know that it affects 
academic performance and social skills, behavioral problems, hyperactivity. The USDA and all of us recognized this many, many years ago. That's why we have the school breakfast program. That's a USDA funded program, the school lunch program, etc. Because kids don't learn well if they're hungry at school. So um, there are, there's some um, uh, research that it increases uh, suicidal ideation. Now in a, in a low income country where there's a high prevalence of food insecurity because there's not enough food availability, um, food insecurity tends to be linked to underweight and malnutrition. Underweight and malnutrition. In the US it's associated with overweight and obesity. Overweight and obesity. The reason for this is pretty obvious. If you have limited food dollars whether it's your owner from SNAP or what have you, limited food dollars, you're going to buy the most calories that you can get with those limited dollars, right? And the, the best way to do that is to buy fast food, junk food, food that's packed full of calories, but is uh, micronutrient depleted. So fast food and uh, sugary drinks, etc. cetera. Um, this is a picture um, from a newspaper article from Macon, Georgia, about the closure of a supermarket, a grocery store, and the newspaper article was about how there's not a, a lot of great transportation here, um, and now that the grocery store is closed, they found themselves now being in a food desert, as they're called. Public health calls a geographic area where there's limited access to healthy food, a food desert. This is sort of a picture perhaps of a food desert. You see that there might not be good public transportation. You're, um, there's no supermarket around. There are these gas stations though, and they have food. I've been in some gas stations where it's very clear on top of the, like the Twinkie and, and uh, potato chip stands that there are signs that say we accept EBT, right? Meaning we take food stamps which is a big problem if you're living in a food desert. Sometimes food deserts are actually co-located with these geographic areas called food swamps, which is where there's more than enough food, but it's of a particular type. We've all seen these food swamps, and commonly, again, they're co-located with food deserts. One of the reasons that I'm talking about this is that I have a suspicion that our patients with serious mental illnesses are more likely to live in food deserts and food swamps than we are. So it's something for us to think about. This is how I understand how food um, insecurity works to increase risk for mental illnesses. First of all, it's almost always driven by poverty or constrained financial resources and we know that our patients have constrained financial resources. Even if you get SSI, that keeps you underneath the federal poverty level, right? So even if you're getting SSI, you're impoverished. So that leads to food insecurity. It can lead to hunger, which is that uncomfortable physiologic sensation, but it more commonly in our country leads to a reliance on inexpensive energy dense food. Either of those can lead to nutritional def deficiencies, which in, in and of themselves can increase risk for some mental illnesses. This can lead to overweight and obesity. Um, again, the psychological stress and those physiologic stress responses increase risk for things like depression, poor academic performance, etc. Once you have a mental illness, we know that that can lead to social disadvantage like unemployment, which of course is a driver of poverty and, and uh, constrained financial resources. So there's, so there's, so there's really a, a cyclical process going on here, and this is true for any of the social determinants. So I'm going to begin to sort of wrap up now. I just want to summarize that the social determinants of health, because I, I know that across the country there's this increasing interest in the social determinants, but a lot of times what's actually being talked about is social outcomes or social needs. I view the social determinants as problems within and created by society that have major impacts on health and disease. They predate, they predict, they cause poor health outcomes in, in multiple domains. So for example, food insecurity leads to inattention and behavioral problems in school. Job insecurity leads to substance use disorders. 
There are some adverse features of the built environment that lead to anxiety disorders. Um, but they not only increase risk for illness, incidence and prevalence of, of uh, chronic illnesses and mental illnesses, but also if you have an, an existing illness, the social determinants impact your course and outcomes. And I think this is really important when we're thinking about people living with serious mental illnesses. So if you have an illness and you're also impacted by these social determinants, it makes your illness worse. It makes the course and outcomes of your illness worse. How does it do this? Many, many ways. One way is that it's hard to engage in treatment. It's hard to be medication adherence, adherent. It's hard to do disease self-management when you're struggling with these things. If you have food insecurity and you have diabetes, it's really hard to care for your diabetes if you're struggling with food insecurity. I would suggest that the same is true for schizophrenia for major depressive disorder, etc. So for in the case of physical health and physical illnesses, the social determinants like discrimination, food insecurity, housing instability, they cause physical illnesses, but they also cause poorer course and outcomes. The same is true for mental illnesses. These things cause mental illnesses. I'm not saying they're 100 percent causal. Um, we know that Schizophrenia, for, for example, is about, I don't know, 80% heritable, meaning that about 80% of the causation of schizophrenia is somehow genetic. Um, but that leaves the other 20%, right? And we also know that there are gene-by-environment interactions, there's epigenetics, so you're, you, the genetic causation of a disease isn't completely separate from the social and uh, environment um, context. So the same thing is happening here for mental illnesses. They um, increase risk for mental illnesses. But interestingly, unlike physical health conditions, mental illnesses cause these things. If you have hypertension or arthritis, cardiovascular disease, you've had a stroke, they, it, it, it usually doesn't cause these things. Mental illnesses cause discrimination. We used to call that stigma. We don't really call it stigma anymore, we call it discrimination because that's what it is. It's not just a way of thinking about people with mental illnesses, it's a way that we act toward them. It's a way that we behave toward them. That's discrimination. As I pointed out, it, it can lead to food insecurity if you have a mental illness. We all know that it leads to housing instability. Our patients are evicted, they move around a lot, they change homes, etc. So all of these um, social um, determinants are also social outcomes of mental illnesses and therefore they, they really have a much more powerful impact on course and outcomes compared to the physical illnesses. That's why we in mental health really need to focus on the social determinants because they impact our disorders more than physical illnesses. Real briefly, what can we do in the clinical setting? There are things that we can do. Um, for example, we can change our policies within the clinical setting to make sure we're addressing sexism, for example, racism, etc. We can screen for social determinants. As I mentioned, we probably don't do a good job in most settings at screening for food insecurity. There's a validated one item question, a validated two item survey that we can use to screen for food insecurity. And I would suggest that mental health professionals ought to be screening for food insecurity, and then making the connections that are warranted, SNAP, food pantries, or otherwise. So we can do things in the clinical setting. But as I pointed out in the very beginning, at the, at the real foundational level, these things are about public policies and social norms. So if we really want to have an impact, we're going to have to go outside the clinic and we're going to have to work on addressing public policies and social norms. Um, and when I say public policies, it's not just about mental health care. It's not like about parity per se, um, or the structure of the health care system, although that's important. It's about all of these things. Employment policy is mental health policy. Farm and food policy is mental health policy, right? Um, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm working on this second book that APA is going to publish next year, and I want to just tell you what we're going to do in this book. The book is going to be sort of a case study of the ten most important pieces of federal legislation that improved 
mental health in America, the 10 most important pieces of big federal legislation. And they might not be what you think. We have a chapter that's related to employment policy. It's the National Labor Relations Act of 1935 or something. One of the most important pieces of federal le legislation that improved mental health in America. The Clean Air Act of 1963 is another one. I'm writing the chapter right now because I'm interested in food and farms um, on the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933. Has anyone heard of the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933? It was one of FDR's policies, big, big policies in his first 100 days. It was the first farm bill, the first farm bill, and it led to subsequent iterations of the farm bill every three to five years. And the point is, we as mental health professionals ought to be really interested in the Farm Bill because the Farm Bill funds the USDA, it funds the SNAP program, all the other food and nutrition assistance programs like the school lunch program, the school breakfast program. Now that I've shown, I hope, that food security is very much related to mental health and also mental illnesses, we need to be at the table when they're talking about the Farm Bill. Right? We as psychiatrists. And right now there's not a psychiatrist at the table probably. And so they're thinking about it in terms of the food supply chain and uh, the farmers. How is this going to impact the farmers and migrant workers and um, supplementing you know, um, the, the fructose industry and, and all of this stuff. But somebody needs to be saying, hey guys, we need to think about mental health because this piece of legislation is going to have huge impacts years, decades down the road on mental health in America. So the point is health in all policies, mental health in all policies. That's what the social determinants is really about. I'm going to stop here. I know I've said a lot and I'm really curious to um, hear what you're thinking. Thank you so much.